procedural generation, jump points and exploration are topics we'll see regularly featured on community shows this year. We even get to see some footage from No Man's Sky during a question sent in by Zig, who was a bit of a trendsetter when it came to asking about planetary exploration. Good video, and so well, what do you think? Are we going to be able to explore planets? Um, not at first. Right. It's certainly something we're looking at down the road, but uh, we're not, not going to have that like Mass Effect style procedural terrain for the whole planet at first. Right, and we are, exactly. We have a lot, a lot of planets mm -hmm. and landing zones and everything to develop and asteroid bases and and Lots of stuff. There's going to be plenty of stuff to explore in space also. So. Right, which is yeah. kind of the focus of the game. Here's a couple of other examples from early Wingman's Hangar episodes. Superluminal and Superluminal asks, what happens if I fail during the first transit of a jump point? Uh, seems like a quick way to an empty casket. Um, so, uh, well, if you were charting the jump point for the very first time, having to fly it yourself, then yes, if you uh, mess up during the charting, it potentially could... Uh, kill you or you could be spat out in some random system and you not know how to get home. Um, but generally, if it's already been charted and your nav computer has the jump like um, trajectory and coordinates already programmed in, then you'll automatically make it and you'll be fine. So really the risk and jump points are for the uncharted jump points that you don't have a nav uh, path already set. Um, next question is from Krell who asks, are asteroids and other space objects built in a modular fashion? like the ships. It seems like you could design a few different building blocks for constructing asteroids and then randomly assemble them in lots of different ways. Um, so that is a good question. Um, <clears throat> we definitely have quite a few different asteroids, but we're actually doing R&D right now into um, a bunch of procedural generation of asteroids and asteroid fields. So, you know, uh, I know there's been a lot of talk about procedural stuff and, and, and sort of crafted stuff, which Star Citizen is sort of more of a crafted experience, but <clears throat> we certainly are using uh, elements of procedural generation to help us flesh out a lot of the world. So my goal is to, um, to make sure that everything sort of feels designed and crafted, but you use uh, elements of procedural generation to sort of give you the variation that you need. So asteroids are a great example of that where, you know, we have certain rules for asteroids, uh, but, you know, we may, uh, you know, procedurally be generating the asteroid field or the asteroids themselves. And so we're actually doing some uh, pretty cool and interesting work on it. And down the road, we'll probably be sharing that with you guys. The Austin staff are settling into their new offices and when they get a chance are decorating the place with artwork. The Wingman's Hangar team mentioned several times this year that they're hiring staff constantly, presumably to cope with the expanded project scope and increasing number of work streams. We're not even one month in and already Phelan has become a double MVP. Was he the first ever double MVP? If so, it was certainly deserved. Chris Roberts is in the UK visiting Foundry 42. Whilst the video has a tour of the office, it's one stop at a dev's computer which caught my eye. Is this the exterior of the asteroid hangar? The audio is fairly poor, but I'm sure that's what's said. Yeah, asteroid feel, asteroid based. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, asteroid feel, asteroid based. Yeah, absolutely. We're also showing the amazing, monstrous mining robots. These have grown somewhat, like everything does when it's at Foundry 42. Yeah, it's a pretty big mining robot. It's pretty awesome. Very nice. The next great starship kicks off right at the end of January, with Chris Roberts making a couple of statements early on, which will no doubt bring a smile to many fans out there. Tell us what brought you back, Chris. Star Citizen is the game I've always wanted to make and never have been able to make. And one of the reasons why I took a break in the past was that the technology wasn't there in terms of just the fidelity of the simulation and also in terms of how people could interact in a sort of living, breathing universe. Um, so I sort of finally felt like the technology had changed and I could come back and make the game I'd always wanted to make. And essentially the game is the dream. When I was a kid and I watched Star Wars when I was eight and you know I wanted to be Han Solo, get in that ship and fly anywhere in the galaxy and and find my adventures. And uh, that's really what Star Citizen does. And you can pretty much play any character or role. You can, you know, you want to be a merchant, you can be a merchant. You want to be a mercenary, you can be a mercenary. You want to be a pirate, you can be a pirate. Uh, you want to be an explorer, you can be an explorer. And you go from planet to planet, discovering things, buying, selling, upgrading your ship, 
just doing whatever you want and creating a name for yourself in this galaxy. And I, and I think that's something I've always wanted as a game player. And, I, and luckily, I think there's a lot of people out there that want the same thing. So that is Star Citizen. It's an all CIG judging panel for the competition, with the exception of Sean Tracy, who at this point was still working at Crytek. There have been over 200 teams enter the competition from 65 different countries. These have been whittled down to just 25, and these remaining teams are asked to design a gun, something useful, but not too onerous, to show their skills off. In this episode, three of the eight teams featured will be eliminated, with the remaining teams going through to round two, where they'll be asked to design a mercenary gunship. However, the teams shown the door will automatically go into a save pool, from which the community will later be asked to vote their favourite back into the competition. There are several of these save pools during the competition, and they'll be far more important than anyone expected. In this episode, Damage, Raging Vertex and Team Zeus are thrown to the first save pool. They'll be joined by more teams in the next couple of episodes, in the long fight to become the creators of the next great starship. Chris and Erin Roberts are both in Austin for a meeting of all key development staff. There's a clip uploaded to the official YouTube channel, which features a meeting schedule. Having looked through this, one name stands out. Elphonic. I wonder what they could be discussing. Pew Pew. With Ben Lesnick moving to Santa Monica, we have Mike Moreland sitting in for this week's MVP, which goes to Czar for Operation Pitchfork, A Forker's Tale. Which, although this is very good, I have to wonder why the fan focus this week didn't get MVP too. Shader Cool makes fantastic artwork in 3DS Max for how your house would look if it was stylized for the hangar. Rob, when is the dogfighting module coming out? <laughs> Cloud Imperium are coming under pressure over the dogfighting module, with it being expected by most backers to have been released by now. In Wingman's Hangar episode 56, Eric confirms that they're hoping to demo it at PAX East on the 10th of April, if all goes well. Right now though, they're only testing it internally within sites, and not even studio to studio. There are a few updates this month though, with us getting a look at the updated scythe shown side by side with the older version. It'll be in the dogfighting module, although initially only as an AI ship, with owners getting to fly it later on. There are a lot of shite questions sent into Wingman's Hangar this month, but I managed to find a couple of good ones. Um, from Zach, he says, I was wondering about the log out mechanic on multi-crew vessels. For example, if you log off on a friend's constellation and then he logs out of the game before you come back, where will you be when you log back in? Physically take your character onto a ship, you're pretty much signing up for the duration now, of the Now explain trip. that a bit. Now you, you, okay, so you have a choice, right? You can physically get in, I can get in your ship, and be a crew member, or if you call for help, I can jump in and take over an AI there seat you go. for so, a turret. So what this is talking about is when I'm when our characters are together and I'm in your ship. Yeah. So. I am there. I got on board at the last planet you were at. We are going wherever we're going. So if you're if you're getting on for that ride, you're signing up for the whole ride. It's not like you can just jump out in the middle of space and go poof, I'm back home. <laughs> so if you log out prior to your friends logging out and prior to you, you getting to your destination then you should expect to come back on that ship. Now, if that ship is parked in space, for instance, there, there's still some gray area there. It yeah. may be that we'll end up letting you, if, if he's given you permission to fly, we may let you fly the ship the rest of the way, or we may put you back on the last planet you docked on. 
How will discovery of jump points be handled? Once it's discovered, is it automatically uploaded for the verse to use, or will we be able to share it with organization members first, then upload the jump point when we get back to civilized space? You can hold that information for yourself or for your friends, and then when you're ready, give it to, upload it to the universe, as it were. That's, that's a good way to put it. Um, go pass that information on to people who will then disseminate it to others, but... Now what happens if you give the, cl the clan some information and, and me, being a clan member, decides that, uh, hey, I want to name that jet point after me? <laughs> what, what goes on then? If someone else gets there before you do... If before I get kicked out of the clan, point, I get a jet yeah, point named after exactly. me. Exactly. Then right, right before your, your last day in the clan, <laughs> right. you, you can take that yourself. Yeah, so if somebody else finds it while you're keeping the information to yourself, then that person will end up getting to name the jump point. So that's just kind of a risk they take, yeah. right? Later in the month, we're back at Foundry 42 with Erin Roberts, Phil Meller, and Nick Elms talking about the Shubin mining station and the Idris. I mean Idris. Shubin will be part of Squadron 42, but also a location in the persistent universe. At the start of the game, we go to a place uh, like a Shubin mining outpost. So you fly there and you, you put down, but then you you, if, you want, if you want to go sightseeing, you can go around and you can actually study how stuff works. When we first came over there, we just came with like the, the, the small asteroid base with like the generic, you know, mining platform just plumbed into the side. But then the concept guys get older, yeah, change it yeah. a bit. That's the fun bit. Well, you know, watching it evolve. You know, because it, you know, it went from like, you know, what was it about a kilometre long, and now it's six kilometres long. It's just huge. And there's going to be on foot stuff and first person combat on the station as well as yeah. dog fighting around it. So it'll be pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. It's not just a case of, of having a ship and, and, and basically saying, okay, well, it, no, it sort of looks good. Every single mechanic on the ship has to work. All the systems on the ship has to work. We know how the weapon systems work. We know how the weapons are controlled, how they reload. All these things are really important to the design. What I got with the, um, the Idris was a sort of a rough concept of the kind of the shape of the turret. So it was my job to kind of look at that and look at the space that we had inside the Corvette itself and try and figure out how we could come up with a modular system that could be placed into not only the Idris, but any of the capital ships. The original design by Ryan Church had these missiles stacked at um, a slight angle. Um, so we had two options. We could have brought the, um, the actual turret itself down into a horizontal position and then just have the missiles load horizontally. But I actually thought it was a nice little extra layer of animation just to have the, uh, the missile reloading rack just tilt up slightly and uh, slot the missiles in. We've been, uh, well, let's be looking at turrets as well. That's a big, isn't it? Yeah. So we came with a lot of the turrets. They weren't manned initially. But, yeah, we thought, well, I want to get in here, you know. I want to get in that thing and start blasting away. So yeah. So then uh, that was another one we passed off the concept and they came back with some awesome stuff, well, didn't they? Yeah, they, they can be automated, but, but you know, the, the, the way that uh, everything sort of looked at, I think, in, in this universe is, you know, the player could potentially do a better job. So, you know, if he wants to get in a turret that, that was automated, then, um, you know, he can get in there and he can start he can start choosing his own targets and, and blazing away. Yeah. Uh, yeah there's damage states on them, so you can sitting there blasting away, then a, then a armor plate there goes flying off, a barrel there goes flying off, it just, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Everything we do in Squadron 42, we've got to consider the persistent universe. We can't sort of you know, go off a tangent. We've got to plan for everything being functional in the persistent universe. Well, yeah, we had those harvesters, didn't we? And they were just like, uh, yeah, we'll just put some mining drones in the background. They fly around and they just go and harvest. But then initially they started off pretty small, you know, like the size of a transit van, but now they're like, Absolutely huge. A new Star Citizen YouTuber appears on the scene this month, a young chap you may have heard of by the name of SDL Youngblood. I'm not an expert by any means, so this is kind of just a first look at um, you know this game from my channel. But, you know, for those of you that know me, you know, I like I like dogfighting, I like flying, and taking a similar role in a more advanced game is something that I'm really kind of interested in doing. So with that in mind, I'm gonna go ahead and show you uh, my ship. Now I gotta find where to, yeah, wait, where to go. Okay, let me into this bad boy. Bloop. All right. So now we're gonna climb into my ship, which I haven't named yet. You know, I feel like in, uh, you know, I feel like in Planet Side, you know, you crash and you get another ship right away. You know, you're a little bit more invested with this one. So I feel like I should have something creative named for it. So if you guys have any great suggestions, feel free to throw it down. Anyone who's watched a few of Youngblood's Star Citizen videos knows he's a bit of a Star Citizen guru these days, and I particularly enjoy his theory crafting around potential, unconventional uses and loadouts of ships. Keep up the good work, Youngblood, and keep those ship guides coming. 
Chris Roberts opens 10 for the Chairman Episode 9 with a book in his hand. It features a crash landing on a desert planet. Let's hope there's no sandworms, eh Chris? During the episode, Chris is asked by Castor about the Idris changes mentioned earlier in the month. Chris confirms that the Idris has been expanded, as it wasn't able to fulfil everything they'd envisaged for it in Squadron 42. On February 26th, Eric confirms that Oculus Rift support will go live today in a hangar patch released after the show. It's only a rough first pass, but they felt it was important to get it out there so they could get early feedback from the community. There are four episodes of The Next Great Starship in February. Two of these episodes fill up the first save pool, which now has 10 teams vying for the community vote. The community vote results in Infinite Schwer Monkey, or IXM, being saved during episode 1.4 to conclude round 1. So we've now permanently lost AEM, Archon, Damage Association, Dragons of Nirvana, Prosimian Productions, Raging Vertex, Sakura Moon, Team Zeus, and To the Stars and Beyond. And at the start of round 2 in the next great Starship 1.5 on the 20th of February, the judges send 3 Dingo and Catapult Concept into the second save pool. I didn't say this competition would be easy to follow, did I? But it's been good, right Chris? It's been real. It's been a while since we had any juicy motion capture information. The team show off what it's now capable of, and let's face it, this is a vast improvement on what they had the previous year. It features simultaneous capture of facial audio and movement, and can record multiple performers at the same time too. Brian Brewer, Chris Olivia, and Daniel Craig, not that one, and when Man's Hangar episode 61 expand on this with a further update, which includes real-time conversion to game avatars, with rather creepy eyes though. With performance capture you get a more true performance from our actor because everything is being recorded right there, so you get a lot of subtleties that you wouldn't normally capture any other way. How did it go on set? It was a bit chaotic, it was a long, really long week, but uh, we came out in the end. We introduced a lot of things we never had in the pipeline before, so it was uh, it was a lot of challenges. Um, we had to sync everything up with time code. We had to bring the head cams into the system. But we got it all figured out in the end, and uh, we got some good stuff. We got all the actors together, and I've been going through the data in the last week, and uh, it's looking very good and nice and clean. Many takes of the same scene. You can then select the elements that you think are best from each take and you can marry them together to make one seamless scene. We can change gestures if we need to. If somebody needs to t interact with a prop, we can adjust it slightly. You can even go as far as to take just the face and audio from one scene and apply it to another scene. What I'm really excited about is basically seeing how all these little parts fit together. Now we have the motion capture, but uh, the ships, the environments, the characters, the audio, the visual effects, there's so many little parts that come together so I'm really excited to see how the fans perceive this. In one of the studio reports we're given an update on the Hornet. This ship alone has 100 damage states and 10 different points you can currently pew pew at. I'm not sure if this is a bit of a spoiler but they also point out that hitting the engine housing and thrusters is a bit of a weak spot, especially if you want to recover the ship for parts later on. David Ladyman lets us have a look at the new Imperator Jump Point Hardcover Edition, 650 pages of Jump Point magazine. The conversation between David and Eric is quite amusing, and this is one of my favourite clips from the year. Funny story in there that we were, what did we originally say, like four to six pages? We originally promised four to six, right. you originally promised four to six, I wasn't even Oh, we, we, we as a company, yeah. CIG. In the second 10 for the chairman of the month, Dave is back with Chris. They're so dedicated to consistency that they've both worn the same clothes and sat in the same spot as the previous week. Either that or they recorded them at the same time. But they would never trick us like that, right? Joking aside, this is one of the best 10 for the chairman so far. Unfortunately, Dave's mic plays up during the episode, so I've had to exclude him. Sorry, Dave. And where I haven't paraphrased, I've edited these clips down heavily. During the episode, Chris is asked by Spajak why he is citizen number 5 and who UEE citizens number 1 to 4 are. Chris answers that UEE citizen number 1 is the RSI Prime Basic Admin account, number 2 is the old website admin account, number 3 is Ben Lesnick and Chris is actually number 4, although this would later be changed and Chris would become number 1. Here's another couple of non shake questions from this month. How will the chat system in the game work? When we stumble across another player in space, 
How will we communicate with him? Will it be via voice chat, text chat, or both? So we're going to still flesh that out. I mean, our goal is to try and have voice over IP. Uh, we're also going to try and uh, have this technology which we've got up and running. So we'll we'll probably have it called Live Driver, where um, you're you you're actually you can talk, and the webcam on your computer is looking at your face, and it transcribes it to your avatar. So your avatar's mouth moves sort of along lines with what your mouth's moving, and but you're hearing your voice. And we'll probably do some level of voice processing on it because there's a lot of real time filters uh, that we can apply in the sound system that we're going to use. Uh, so it will. So it'll be cool. It'll be sort of like I'll be talking to you as a pilot. We're going to let people hail uh, other people, and then if someone accepts the hail, then you can talk to them because you also don't want people just always abusing you and uh, spamming you. Um, and uh, if you don't want to use voice chat, you could also be using uh, sort of text chat in a, in a box. Um, so you have, you'll hopefully have both those options. So voice over IP is definitely part of our plan. So far, we're, we're planning to have it in. Um, probably won't be in for dogfighting uh, V1. I'm not even sure whether we'll have text chat for Dogfight V1, but as the year progresses, this stuff will, will get in there. Uh, but I'm sure all you will find ways to harass each other without having it built into the system. There's a couple of new faces in the Santa Monica office this month, with James Pugh and Will Lewis both starting. Will's first appearance on Wingman's Hangar includes him handing Phelan his third MVP of the year. I mean seriously man, give the rest of us a chance. For his amusing thread about what you didn't know about CIG devs. So now that now that you're going to be moderating the forums, responsible for banning everyone, I yes. guess it is time for me to hand over the Ben Hammer. Ah, oh, thank you very much. So great power, great responsibility. <laughs> but uh, don't you all worry, uh, Sun has me covered. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Aurora Crash by Test Squadron also gets a mention in this week's Fan Focus 2. There's a bit of a data dump mid-March when it comes to NPCs and AI. Moon Collider take part in a studio update. These guys, Ben Lowing, the AI programmer, Matthew Jack, CEO, and Mike Bell, the lead engineer, started a new company, but Mike was also one of the primary AI programmers at Crytek, who'd since gone independent. As Chris Roberts says during the clip, he was keen to work with AI programmers, and the fact that one of Moon Collider's programmers was also one of the key Crytek AI programmers was a huge bonus. One of the big things about Kythera is that it's dynamic. What is dynamic navigation? So dynamic navigation is a feature for the first person combat where AIs will react to the world changing. So if you've got a, a ship landing in a hangar then um, the characters know to route around it instead of walking straight through where the ship now is. Whenever stuff changes it's recomputed on the fly um, and we try and bring that dynamic approach to everything we do. We don't want the AI to be too controlled, we want it to be to react sensibly to the player. So we can't, designers can't specify every single thing this AI will do. We just give it, these are your objectives, do them in an intelligent way, and react to the player itself. We also need the meta AI, which is kind of what does that NPC do during the day? You know, is he, you know, it's a pirate, he gets up in the morning, brushes his teeth, goes to work, raiding some innocent traders, and then after he's gotten his ill-gotten gains, he goes and fences them, and then goes to the bar and has some drinks and celebration, and goes to bed. And what is that pirate's life goal? What's he trying to do? Is he trying to build a pirate empire, or is he just wants to be a solo operator? And so there's these different levels of AI that go from sort of the basic sort of tactical, okay, how do I get around a corner, or how do I navigate to somewhere, to like, what am I doing today, or what am I doing this week, or what am I doing this year? Ten for the Chairman episode 13 has a handful of interesting questions, so I've edited these down or summarised them as best as possible. Regarding star maps, will organisations be able to apply their own markers and notations on the star map so that all or selected members of the organisation can share information, such as resource nodes held by allies, enemies, troop movements, etc. If you fly around in a lot of areas, you may find an asteroid field that isn't on the navigation map or something else is on the navigation map, and then you essentially map that on your map and, and you can write your own notes about it, and then you can share that with members in your organization. You would be able to, say, sell some of that to a general um, you know, cartographer company, because you know, think of uh, the navigation computers just like a, a Monday GPS, right? And you get an updated disk of, of like uh, locations to drive in. So another option is explorers could go around mapping stuff out, and then when they've mapped out um, the system fully, they can go and sell that, and that can become for purchase for a large group of people in the same way that we talked about for uh, jump points. Uh, in the dogfight module, where is our hangar located? 
Are we already in space on a station? If so, how do we get the ship out of the hangar without creating a vacuum? That is a good question, but um, the concept with the dogfight module is actually that you're flying uh, essentially a simulation inside your hangar. Practice flying around, fighting with your friends, but not taking your actual ship out into space and, and risking uh, you know, loss of equipment or life. Uh, and so that is uh, what we're calling Arena Commander. And uh, you know, it's a bit of a nod to a game I may have made in the past. Uh, um, but it is the beginning of the stub of the Arena mode that will be in the game, which will be throughout uh, the game. So it's kind of one of the, uh, the features that um, you know, will be useful. And I think longer term, people would probably use this feature to sort of, I don't know, do esports or challenge each other without having to, uh, you know, lose, um, you know, their precious cargo or precious ship. So, uh, so we don't have to worry about a vacuum at the moment because it's all virtual. By the time Wine Man's Hangar Episode 62 comes around, Cloud Imperium have the dogfighting module hosted online, with more than a cry engine imposed eight people limit playing at the same time. The asteroid hangar is also coming along nicely, behaviour showcasing it and explaining how the room system will work to allow expansion of hangars in the future. So it's a, it's a hangar that will be found on some of the Eero location uh, that we're building, so uh, mostly lawless space. Uh, they're, they're built so that they, they're really small and they feel like you can hide there, basically, as a pirate or not. I'm, I'm pretty sure like Caterpillar and Constellation are currently the, the biggest we can fit. Yeah. Um, but then there's still, you know, much bigger ships out there. So it's also something that we need, needed to think about when uh, designing the, the expansion. So at some point when the player will be able to, you know, expand, uh, he will be able to choose the type of room he needs for the type of ships he want to uh, fit in. And we have to keep going back and forth because the size of the caterpillar is quite large, as he's mentioned, and we have to take into account extra size on each side of the caterpillar as it takes off. Um, maybe not necessarily um, every takeoff would be smooth, so your ship might move side to side. And we wanted to avoid uh, making the player go through this tiny rabbit hole. Um, and crash inside his hangar or something. It's time for another TNGS update. Cloud Imperium teases with a quick look at the Vandal Harvester ground vehicle at the start of episode 1.7. And by the end of this month, the next great starship will be down to just 12 teams from the initial 25, with three of these teams having been saved by the community vote. Infinite Schwer Monkey, Talon Corp and Three Dingo. The next great starship Dogfight Special 1.1 has Dan Giesling talking to the teams in his capacity as community ambassador. It's a good excuse to see what the teams have been up to, and to be fair, Chris seems to be really enjoying himself. Pew 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 pew. <laughs> We're still a while away from the final, but the teams will now be left for several weeks to focus on working on the ships. For your information, my favourite was still in the competition at this time, but I don't want to say who because I don't want to sound biased. Shard Collective. I always wanted more ships. Do we want to give this away right now? I don't... Hey everybody, welcome to Wingman's Hangar, the final episode ever. Mm -hmm.